Return of the Indian, chapter 18, Algonquin. Remember, the Algonquins were the enemies of the Iroquois. There was an air of fear about the village. As twilight fell, the villagers seemed to be preparing to decamp. Such men as were left, mainly old, plus some wounded or unfit ones, were giving orders, and the women were running here or there, packing things into bundles. Others came with buckets of water and put out the few cooking fires that were burning, removed the pots, and rounded up the children. A few dogs were dashed about, barking excitedly, sensing something in the hurrying and the anxious voices. You remember where Omri is? He's part of the teepee, remember? Omri watched all this in growing alarm. The minutes were ticking by. Being apparently nothing more than a picture on the side of the teepee, he couldn't see how he could be in danger himself, but he was desperately worried about Bright Star's boon and the baby. After a while, one of the old women came around the teepee into Omri's sight. She was hobbling, hobbling along as fast as she could, gazing up at the teepee with gaping mouth as if it had dropped from nowhere, as in a way it had. She bent at the flap and called. Bright stars answered. The old woman hobbled away again, her white hair glowing in the deep twilight. The tall pines around the camp now stood out black against the darkening sky. Ami heard bright stars in the teepee say to Boone, Village, leave now. What's that? Leave for where? Hide in wood. There was a pause, and then she said doubtfully, Boone, come? No, I can't. Why no? Here no safe. They're not safe. Not for me. I don't fit in, gal. You know that. Bright Star said no more. There was a pause, and then the teepee flap opened, and she came out with her baby wrapped up in some hide torn from her skirt. She turned in the opening, and there was a very soft look in her eyes as she looked, presumably at Boone, standing out of Omri's sight indeed. Then she hurried away, mingling in with the knot of other Indians at the center of the village. Soon they were forming into a rough procession. It was almost too dark to see now, but Omri could just make them out as they silently made their way out of the circle of ruined and half-burnt buildings. Even the dogs were quiet now as they trailed along after the villagers, one of them lingering past the teepee. He paused to leave his mark against the side of it. You know what that means when a dog leaves its mark? It goes to the bathroom. And for a moment, he looked up straight at Omri. His lips drew back over teeth which shone white in the darkness, and he whined uneasily. The hair on the back stood up straight. Then he tucked his long tail between his legs and shot off after the others. It's like the dog can tell that Omri is somehow inside that picture. Soon the last rustles and murmurs subsided, and there was a deep silence broken only by the call of a single owl. Bird or a signal? Omri had never known real fear. All he could compare this with was walking up Havel Road and knowing he had to pass the skinheads who were waiting for him. That seemed to him like nothing at all now. What was the worst they could have done to him after all? A black eye, a few bruises? This was another category of fear altogether. Yet what was he afraid of? Nothing could happen to him. At any second now, Patrick would turn the key in the lock of the chest and recall him to his body, to normality, to the utter blissful safety of his own life, which he had never thought about before, far less appreciated. So what was this icy feeling which could only be terror? Perhaps it was for Boone. Boone was behind him in the teepee, no longer a tiny figure, but a full-sized man, out of his place, out of his time, visible, solid, vulnerable, and quite alone. How lonely could you be? Ami could hardly imagine how Boone must be feeling as he waited in the teepee for some unknown thing to happen. And suddenly it did. It began with another hoot from the owl, and then Ami saw a swift movement to one side of him, close to the edge of the clearing, and then again on the other side, and then a man's figure crouched low scurried past him, and abruptly the whole clearing seemed to be full of moving men. Now remember, he was only supposed to say five minutes, right? Now he is this picture. He is the picture. Look at, the, what, look at what the Indian has in his hand. Could that be danger to a teepee? They were not Frenchmen, of course. They were Indians. Little Bear's men returning to defend the place? I'm restrained to see them. All he could make out was glimpses of leggings, of a head feather, the flash of an axe head catching the starlight. Then he saw that several men were raking wood from the cooking fires into one heap in the center of the ring of longhouses. Shadows began to spread from a light source in the midst of the men, and suddenly a flame leapt high in another. The fire had been lit, and at once Omri could see. These were not Little Bear's men. Their clothes were different, their heads were shaved, their headdresses, even their movements were alien. Their faces, too, their faces. They were wild, distorted, ter terrifying masks of hatred and rage. They, will, they were Algonquins, coming to sack the village. 
In the light of the central fire, they ran to and fro, dozens of them scores. It took only moments for them to find out they'd been outwitted, that the village was empty and that there was nothing to steal, no women to carry off, and their anger burst into howls and yelps. Through this outburst, Ami heard a smothered groan below him. Boone, he must be peering out at this awful scene. Now the Indians were dripping, I'm sorry, dipping branches into the big fire to make torches. They were dancing and shouting and leaping, and several of them were running to the few unburnt longhouses, and suddenly Omri knew. He knew what he had feared. They were going to burn the teepee, and he was part of it. The teepee was on the edge of the clearing. There were other things to set on fire first, but they would get to him. They were coming closer, their howls fiercer, their torches swirling in clouds of smoke above their half-naked heads. And Omri began to scream silently because, of course, he can't talk. He's just a picture. Patrick, Patrick, do it now. Turn the key. Bring me home. Save me. He saw an Indian making straight for him. His face in the torchlight was twisted with fury. And for a second, Omri saw under the shaven scalp, decorated with a single scalp lock, the mindless, destructive face that looked like a skinhead almost, just before he lashed out. The torch went back with the man's right arm. There was a split-second pause and then came hurtling through the air and struck the panel of hide just beside Omri. It slithered down to the ground and lay there, its flames chewing the bottom edge. <clears throat> the Algonquin licked his lips, snarling like a dog, and ran back to the central fire. And Omri had not realized that he could smell as well as see and hear. And now he smelt the smoke, the stench of burning hide. It was dry and it caught quickly, and in helpless horror, Omri watched the burnt area growing up beside him like the letter A, edged with flame. He hardly noticed another Indian approaching from the other side with another blazing brand until suddenly, out of the daze of fear he had fallen into, Omri heard a loud bang. The Indian left the ground briefly. His fingers jerked open, the torch fell, then the man did the same, dropped like a stone, and lay motionless on his back while the branch burnt harmlessly beside him. And all the others stopped dead, their grim faces turned toward the teepee. The shot had come from below. Omri saw the tip of a revolver barrel poking out of a slit in the hide just underneath him. And as the whole pack of Algonquins began to run, howling and yelling toward the teepee, their monstrous shadows sliding along the ground ahead of them, more shots rang out. And two... And then three more Indians fell. The others hesitated and then scattered. The fire burnt clear in the center unattended. The fire that was eating the teepee burnt too. And inside behind him, Omri could hear and even feel Boone frantically beating at the licking flames with something, his hat perhaps, and cursing, but it was useless. The fire was spreading. Get out, Boone. Run, Boone. Run into the forest. Save yourself. Smoke flowed past the painted animal Omri was inhabiting and blinded him. From the dark heart of the fear, Omri heard a new sound. He could see nothing now, but through the snapping of the flames, which were already licking at him, came a sudden, deafening rattle. And then isolated bangs, nearer and nearer, and with no other warning, something exploded almost under him, and the teepee crashed to its side. <coughs> Omri felt it on top of him. The fire noise stopped, and so did the smoke, although the smell was still there. The falling teepees had put the flame out. There was a sensation of heaviness and then of threshing, and he could hear Boone's rich cursing as he struggled to get out of the crumpled, half-burnt folds of the tent. Boone has no idea that Omri is a part of the tent. He has no idea. He's just stuck in this burning tent. In his struggles, he turned the whole thing over, and now Omri was staring up at the night sky, and he could see the stars with smoke drifting close above him and the reflection of the central bonfire on the few pine tops. A cowboy boot loomed for a second against the starlight and came down narrowly, missing Omri. Boone stood above him astride him, firing into the surrounding darkness once, twice. Take that, you flea-bitten coyote, he yelled. And then a click. And Omri found that he'd been counting. And that was the sixth and last bullet. The rattle came again closer, and Boone flung himself down on the fallen teepee and on Omri. And Omri could smell his sweat now and feel how his heart was thundering through his shirt hear him muttering a mixture of curses and prayers. The machine gun bullets whizzed overhead. There was a numbing crash of another hand grenade exploding somewhere near the big fire. Now to the noise of explosions were added shrieks and screams of terror and other shouts, war cries, as Little Bear's men descended from ambush onto the hapless Algonquins. Omri heard the thunder of a single pair of hoofs drumming on the ground beneath him. Boone rolled aside, and at almost the same moment the stars were blotted out as a pony, clear jumped over the teepee 
and Boone and all in a wild leap. And as it galloped on, Omri caught a glimpse of Little Bear on its back, waving a rifle above his head, riding down three fleeing Algonquins. The noise of the firing was now continuous and deafening. Omri could see the flash of large and small explosions in the dark. The tide of the battle swept to and fro chaotically. Twice or three times, small groups of Indians, whether friends or enemies, Omri couldn't tell, raced across the fallen tent. One tripped over Boone and went flying, and his bare foot scraped Omri's face. It was a nightmare to end nightmares. Utterly powerless, unable to move or escape or fight back or even close his eyes and ears, Omri had long since stopped hoping that some miracle would save him. He had totally forgotten Patrick, forgotten his other life. He was a helpless witness to the chaos and carnage of war. He was part of it, yet not part of it. It seemed it would go on forever or until some kind of oblivion engulfed him. And then in the tenth part of a second, it ended. The noise, the smoke, the cries, the terror, the helplessness, gone. Silence. And he lay curled up in darkness darkness on something hard, and he could feel his body, his wonderful three-dimensional body. And light fell on him in warm air, and he heard Patrick's voice with panic in it calling his name. And he lifted himself slowly, and one hand clutched the edge of the chest, and the other went to the right side of his face, and Patrick was staring at him aghast as, as if he saw a stranger. Oh, my God, Omri, are you all right? Omri didn't answer. The side of his head felt funny. He took his hand away, and some black stuff was on his fingers. Something was odd about his nose, too. He felt something running out of it, and he looked down, and there was blood on his sweatshirt. What, what happened to you? You look, your nose, your nose is bleeding and your hair. None of that mattered. The blood and the singed and blackened hair meant nothing. They didn't give him any pain or any fear, at least none that he would call fear now. Stiffly, Omri crawled out of the chest, trying to get his mind back together to clear it, to adjust. Patrick was babbling something about Omri's mother. She just came in and I couldn't do anything and she made me go downstairs to the phone and then she wouldn't let me come back up again and she kept asking where you were and she delayed me and I was going crazy and she wouldn't let me and Omri, I'm so sorry. You look terrible as if you've nearly been killed or something. What happened? Is it over? Should we bring the others back? Omri had a pad of something pressed to his nose. His head, where the fire had licked, was beginning to sting. It was awfully hard to think. He remembered what Boone had said about Little Bear and kept repeating to himself, Poor Critter's had a shock. Poor Critter. The poor creature was himself. The others, he turned suddenly. Get Boone back, he shouted. Not the others, but get Boone, hurry. Patrick snatched up the plastic teepee and Boone's figure from under it. Don't forget his hat, Omri said idiotically. Patrick scrabbled about on the earth of the seed tray and almost threw it after the figure in the tent, and he slammed down on the lid of the chest and turned the key. If only he's not dead, breathed Omri. His head was beginning to ache piercingly from the burnt side, and Patrick threw up the lid again. And they looked down into the belly of the chest. The teepee was a crumpled wreck, twisted and blackened. Boone lay on top of it. He was very still. For one horrible moment, Omri thought a stray bullet or the blast from an explosion must have killed him. But then he raised his red head and looked up at them. Is it over? he called. It's over for us, Boone, said Omri. Gently he lifted him out. Was you there too? Where was you, son? You were lying on me part of the time, said Omri. Boone didn't even try to puzzle this out. Dang me if that wasn't the most fearsome thing I ever been through in my entire life. Me too, said Omri soberly. Patrick was staring at them. Have I missed it, he said. Is it over? I don't know, said Omri. With a sudden movement, Patrick leapt into the chest. What are you doing, cried Omri, although he knew. Send me back. I've missed everything and you've seen it. Send me back. No. You've got to. It's only fair. Never mind fair. You don't know what you're talking about. It was never mind that you missed it. You're lucky. But it's no use. I wouldn't send you now for a million dollars. And Patrick saw that he meant it. And when he looked at Omri's face, brave as he was, he really couldn't be sorry. He climbed slowly out again. Tell me about everything, he said. So Omri told him with Boone chipping in. And Boone had accounted for three, possibly four Indians before he ran plumb out of bullets. You better do something about that burn, Patrick said in the end. Yeah, what though? You're going to have to let your mom see it sometime. How am I going to explain it? And my nosebleed? Patrick said the nosebleed was nothing. We could have had a fight. But the burn was a problem. Half the hair on that side of his head was gone. And there was a big red blister. How do you explain that to your parents? 
Half my hair is gone, and there's a big red blister where it's been burned. Ugh. Well, you don't have to worry about explaining it now, said Patrick. They've gone out. Who? Your lot, your parents and your brothers. Is the babysitter here? No, not yet. She's late. Can you cope till morning? Nami didn't know. He supposed so. He was ashamed to admit how his heart had sunk when Patrick said his mother wasn't in the house, and he suddenly wanted her. He wanted to tell her everything and let her take care of it and him. Well, he couldn't. That was all. Just as well, perhaps. Boone, exhausted, flopped down in the longhouse for a sleep after flinging back the last of the whiskey, and Patrick and Ami slipped down to the next floor bathroom and found some ointment, which Ami rubbed into his own head. The sight of himself in the mirror scared him silly. His face was white, red, and black. He felt he could be doing with a little whiskey himself, but he made do with some aspirin. What about the others, asked Patrick. I don't know. Ami felt the whole thing had gone well beyond his control. Having seen Boone, Little Bear, and Bright Stars full-sized, he could no longer think of them in the same way. Some part of him, until the battle, had still thought of them as his, not, not toys exactly, but belonging to him within his orbit. This illusion was now gone. What was happening back in the village, whatever it was, he was responsible for it. He couldn't avoid the realization that he had sent devastating modern weapons back in time and that they had certainly killed people. Baddies, of course, but who were the baddies? If Patrick a year ago had given him a present of some other plastic Indian, let's say it would have been an Algonquin, then the Iroquois would have been the en enemies. Suddenly Ami felt the nightmare was not there, but here. I think we should bring them back, said Patrick. Bring them back if you want to, said Ami, who suddenly felt tired to death. I've got to sleep. He started back up the stairs to his room and stopped. Not up there. He wanted neutral ground. He turned and went down again. Where are you going, asked Patrick. Down to the living room. I'm going to sleep on the sofa. What about when the babysitter comes? Tell her to go in the breakfast room. He stopped and met Patrick's eyes. Don't do anything stupid, he said. I really can't cope with any more. I'll take care of everything, said Patrick. Ami went on, his feet like lead weights, and in the living room he didn't even put on the light. He just threw himself onto the sofa, where in two minutes he was fast asleep. He's been through a lot. He's very injured.